Good morning, everyone, um, and welcome to our third and last webinar in the series of uh, Paradigm Shift in Facility Management. I first have to apologize for all the technical glitches that we've experienced this morning, but it may be that due to the cold front that is over South Africa, the IT lines are also slow this morning. But I am Marty van der Wolf. I'm from the Medical Research Council. Um, and I am, um, together with the CSIR, we are hosting the series of the webinars. First of all, I have to see me, but there could be some of our participants that's already good afternoon and good evening. And thank you for your active participation in our series of webinars. Then I also want to welcome um, the panelists, they've prepared excellent presentations for today, for the last webinar. And today we focus on how to safeguard yourself and the office. Our house rules are that automatically all of the participants will be muted. Um, but we ask you to be interactive in the webinar to share your comments or questions during the presentations in the chat box and at the end we will have an interactive questions and answer session. The webinars will also be um, posted um, at the end after today. All three webinars should have missed uh, some of them. So without further ado, I want to introduce my co-host for today, Ms. Katakani Ngobeni, who is a senior researcher at CSIR. Um, Katakani has made exceptional contributions in the field of infection prevention and control over the past nine years. And she specializes in personal protective equipment is, and is passionate about the correct wearing of masks and respirators. So Katakani, I give over to you to, to introduce our first speaker. Uh, thank you, Marty. Uh, good morning uh, to all our participants and good morning to the panelists as well. So our first speaker is going to be uh, Marilyn Krabler. Uh, Marilyn is, has obtained her Bachelor of uh, Clinical Medical Practice at the University of Pretoria Cum Laude in 2013. She started her career as a practicing clinician primarily in emergency medicine. She then pursued a career into academics and was a lecturer at the University of Pretoria for five years before joining the Foundation for Professional Development as a project manager within the School of Health Sciences where she's part of the team that um, has been responsible for producing various short courses on the current COVID pandemic. And she's also still practicing um, as a clinician at Vilkos Trauma Unit after hours. So Marilyn, over to you. Thank you very much, Katakani, and welcome everyone to this webinar. Today, I'm going to take you through a presentation on COVID-19 and how to stay safe amidst this pandemic. We will cover the following topics today. We're going to look at the transmission of COVID-19. I'm just going to give you a broad overview of this. Then we're going to look at the incubation period of SARS-CoV-2, things to consider before going out, tips on when you are out and about, and what to do and not to do when you come home. Then we're just going to quickly recap the symptoms of COVID-19 and look at what self-screening tools you can implement. Understanding how COVID-19 spreads is absolutely critical to try and stop the spread of COVID-19 but also to protect yourself against contracting SARS-CoV-2. When a person living with COVID-19 coughs, sneezes, or talks, there are droplets infected with the virus that enter the air surrounding them. These microscopic droplets can then be suspended in the air and inhaled by a secondary, previously healthy person, and so the virus is spread. The virus will rapidly multiply in the new infected host, and they might then start becoming symptomatic. The second route of transmission is through infected surfaces and then touching your mouth, nose or eyes. 
The surface resilience of COVID-19 has been a frequent topic of discussion. And a recent study done and published in the New England Journal of Medicine evaluated the stability of SARS-CoV-2 in aerosols and on various surfaces and its associated decay rates. This was compared with SARS-CoV-1, which causes SARS, and five surfaces were tested. It revealed that plastic and stainless steel surfaces allowed the virus to survive for up to three days. This will be the basis on which we build later in this presentation on the importance of sanitizing surfaces. For healthcare workers that are working closely with patients that are under investigation for COVID-19, this spread is the basis for the importance of wearing the correct personal protective equipment at all times. Next, we're going to consider the incubation period of COVID-19. When considering the incubation period, it is important to understand that there are three scenarios to consider. The first scenario is the asymptomatic transmission. There have been reported cases, although there are few, of patients that never developed symptoms after being exposed to the virus that transmitted the virus to other people that then did indeed develop symptoms after coming into contact with the asymptomatic patient. The second scenario is your pre-symptomatic transmission. Pre-symptomatic transmission occurs between exposure to the virus and the onset of symptoms, which is usually between day five and six after becoming exposed to the virus. Some infected people may be contagious during this pre-symptomatic stage, similar to the asymptomatic patient. The pre-symptomatic period is known to be less contagious, but infection in this state is still possible. And what makes this a problem is that most people that are in this stage are unaware of the fact that they are infected. The third and most common stage is symptomatic transmission. Symptomatic transmission occurs from a person that is experiencing any of the known symptoms of COVID-19 to a previously unexposed person. Transmission, which we have discussed, can then occur through inhaled aerosol particles if social distancing is not adhered to, or through touching infected surfaces. Shedding of the virus is highest during the upper respiratory tract infection stage, which usually is the first three days after the onset of symptoms. The take home message on this is the incubation period is that transmission can occur before or without someone experiencing symptoms. I want to also bring it under your attention that there are also emerging studies that state that transmission does not occur when a patient living with COVID-19 is asymptomatic, but those are few and far between and therefore the recommendation is to rather be vigilant until this can be confirmed. Planning to go out is essential. Don't take anything that you won't be using. Remember, everything that you take out with you has the potential to bring the virus back home with you. Remove your watch and jewelry. Do not take large bunches of keys. Rationalize the use and remove the keys that you won't be using. A phone is known not to be very clean since we touch it so often. So you should therefore put your phone into a Ziploc bag and limit the amount of times you touch your phone while out. So avoid social media. If you will be eating at work, take your food in a disposable bag and take your own cutlery and utensils. Remember, plastic and stainless steel allow the virus to survive for up to three days. Check that your face mask is intact and clean. You should clean your mask with hot water and iron it to ensure that it is clean after every use. Take your own hand sanitizer to ensure that you don't run into a situation where you don't have hand sanitizer. The golden rule when you go out is that everything and everyone potentially has COVID-19. I'm not saying this to make you paranoid, but rather so that you become aware. We often touch things without cognizantly being aware of the fact that we are touching surfaces. But with COVID-19, you have to train yourself to become aware of what you do. When you are out at work, wear a cloth mask correctly. The mask has to cover your mouth and your nose. Do not touch your mask. Yes, it's uncomfortable, but for now, wearing a mask is our new norm. Be aware of the fact that a cloth mask alone will not prevent you from contracting COVID-19. The face mask creates a barrier for the droplets, but doesn't completely stop them due to the fact that they are less than five microns in size. The cloth mask is therefore has to go with social distancing and not instead of. 
frequently sanitize your hands, especially if you have touched any surfaces, but also in between. As we've mentioned, we are not always consciously aware that we are touching something. When sanitizing your hands, remember, it should be for at least 20 seconds and you should use an alcohol-based sanitizer for this to be effective. Work in a hand washing routine into your day because this still remains the most effective way to clean your hands. Become paranoid about social distancing of at least one and a half to two meters, even with close friends. Don't touch anything you don't absolutely have to touch. Limit the time that you are away from your house and do not touch your face. This is crucial to keep yourself safe. Be careful not to be trapped in the statistic mindset. It's easy to rationalize that only around 7% of people globally that get COVID-19 will succumb to it, which means that 93% of people will get a mild form and recover. COVID-19 is a pandemic and it has killed. You can with no certainty say that you won't be part of the 7% statistic. And therefore, it is with our, our own best interest to protect ourselves. It is important that you protect yourself and your family when you come back home. Leave everything that doesn't need to come inside in your car. When you come home, don't touch anything. If you have touched something like the door handle, clean it with a bleach solution. Remove your shoes and leave them outside before coming into your house. Remove your clothes and place them in a bag if you can't immediately wash them. When you do wash your clothes, make sure that you wash them in hot water of at least 60 degrees Celsius. Leave your keys and your personal belongings in a box close to the door. Have a shower immediately if possible, or at least wash all of the open areas such as your hands, your face, and clean your phone and glasses. What is important is that you limit the spread of COVID-19 as much as possible. It will not be possible to take the risk completely away, but you want to limit the chance of you and your family getting ill. Don't bring, bring COVID-19 home with you. Let's review the COVID-19 symptoms. It is important to recognize early when you are having symptoms that are suggestive of COVID-19. The symptoms of COVID-19 include a fever with a body temperature of above 38 degrees Celsius, a dry cough, shortness of breath, new loss of taste or smell, a sore throat, muscle pain, diarrhea and or vomiting. The NICD recommends that people on the front line should perform daily self-screening. You should keep a record of your self-screening and if you do develop any of the symptoms previously discussed, act fast, get tested and protect your family and the potential public that you may come into contact with. It should however be noted that at the moment, in South Africa specifically, we are experiencing a dire shortage of testing swabs and reagents. And this is a phenomenon that is seen in the public as well as in the private sector. So at the moment, priority for testing is given to healthcare workers, hospital inpatients, pre-admission testing, symptomatic outpatients with two or more symptoms, high-risk patients with comorbidities, and there is currently a hold on testing for COVID-19 positive patients that are requesting retesting after 14 days, close and low risk contacts requesting testing um, less than day, eight days after exposure that are not symptomatic, low risk contacts and return to work screening for non-healthcare workers, as well as workplace prevalence screening. Self-screening should be implemented diligently by yourself. If you do develop symptoms, self-isolate at home and do not expose other members in your household of the or the general public. Remember, not all people living with COVID-19 will require in-hospital admission and most will be able to be symptomatically managed at home. Flattening the curve and curbing the spread of COVID-19 is in all of our best interests. Let's pull together and be responsible. We can do this. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Marilyn. That was a very informative presentation. So now we're going to move on to our next speaker, who is Mr. Tichuana Kumirai. So please note, if you have any questions, um, just jot them down and we will address them after all the panelists or the presenters have uh, had their chance. So next, now we have uh, Mr. Tichuana Kumirai, who is a um, mechanical engineer at the Council for Scientific and Industrial Research 
and he has two master's degrees in uh, mechanical engineer. He's been with the Council for Scientific and Industrial Research for 10 years, and I know he has a personal passion for teaching and educating. So, um, Mr. Tichuana Komarai, over to you, sir. Hello, everyone. Uh, right. Uh, so, uh, okay. So, I'm 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 going to be talking about uh, non-chemical disinfection uh, 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 methods, uh, particularly the use of uh, portable air cleaners. Uh, Okay, so that is the outline of my talk. First, I'll give just a small introduction. Then I will go into uh, portable air cleaners. Um, uh, then performance specifications for portable air cleaners. And then some bit of some formulas on uh, sizing of portable air cleaning systems. And uh, lastly, the maintenance and monitoring for uh, portable air cleaning air cleaners. Right, so uh, I'm aware that uh, uh, in the series for this webinar, uh, there was been, there's been a lecture already on uh, ventilation as a method that reduces um, the levels of indoor air pathogens. Uh, so, uh, ventilation is not the only method that can be utilized to, uh, to reduce the levels of uh, indoor air pathogens. There are also several alternative uh, technologies uh, that can be used to reduce levels of uh, indoor air airborne pathogens. So, um, uh, this this th this uh this this talk this this uh, uh lecture is about uh portable air cleaners that um use various mechanisms uh uh that use various mechanisms for the reduction of levels of indoor air pathogens so okay i'm going to uh try to define what a, a, a portable air cleaner is a portable air cleaner is a device that we install in our indoor environments with the purpose to reduce the indoor air pathogens so these devices are they are normally floor standing or wall mounted and they are plugged into an electrical outlet so uh, I'm going. What I'm going mainly to be talking about is the uh, the mechanisms, the various mechanisms that uh, are used by these uh, portable air cleaners to reduce the levels of uh, pathogens. Right. So also just to mention that uh, the basic components of uh, a portable air cleaner device it consists of uh, well, it consists of I can say uh, three things. Uh, the first one uh, being the, the 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 mechanism, the mechanism uh, through which it reduces uh, uh, indoor air pathogens, and the second one it has got a fan. So a fan uh, pulls air through the 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 the, the, the mechanisms. The, through the mechanisms that through the mechanism that reduces uh, pathogens and the third component obviously this is an enclosure design uh, it is enclosed within a space so basically uh i'm going to talk about uh these mechanisms that 
are utilized in portable air cleaners. The first one, photocatalytic oxidation, uh, the use of ozone, the use of ionization, plasma, HEPA filtration, and then uh, UVGI. So photocatalytic oxidation, in short, it, uh, it, 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 it uses two major things. So it uses uh, a light source, a light source shining on a, on a titanium uh, dioxide uh, coated surface. Uh, uh, so the light source activates the titanium dioxide to be able to react with uh, the constituencies of the pathogen and then for in the reaction uh, uh, it causes the 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 the, 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 the deactivation the deactivation of the pathogen or it, it does it it co it, it has the, that germicidal effect to the pathogen right uh, another th interesting thing about this uh, technology, uh, PCO technology, is that it can be applied in uh, on surfaces like uh, the, the the previous speaker was talking about. You know, touching doorknobs or handrails, light switches. So this can be applied on those um, on those uh, uh, surfaces, and then uh, and those surfaces, they if they are exposed or if they are irradiated with some light, be it natural light or light from fixtures, that uh, 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 activation of the titanium oxide can continuously uh, disinfect uh, that surface. Uh, then the third one uh, is uh, ozone. Uh, uh, Ozone, ozone also uh, has an ability uh, to uh, have a reaction with the constituencies, with the constituents uh, of, um, of, 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 this, uh, uh, of of pathogens and therefore um, uh, having a germicidal effect uh, after the reaction. Uh, but also it is important to note that uh, 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 ozone is not recommended, ozone generators are not recommended to be used uh, in, uh, within indoor environments because uh, uh, they can be uh, dangerous to occupants. So ionization, ionization, uh, ionization simply is uh, introducing an uh, uh, in electromagnetic field, it's simply introducing uh, uh, charging particles, charging the, the pathogens to have uh, charges. And when the particles are charged, uh, they are easy to form uh, agglomerates. Or simply it means they can gather together in lumps and therefore they can be precipitated out of the airstream. Plasma, plasma, uh, plasma like ionization, it consists of ions also, and it's got an ability to uh, charge these um, uh, pathogens, hence having the same kind of effect with ionization. Then uh, uh, the other mechanisms going forward with mechanisms, uh, aerosol filtration. Uh, so uh, there I started with a, a definition for what is an, a, a filter. So a filter is a porous structure that is usually made of fibers. Uh, uh, fiber is, a, is, a, is, a, is, a, is just a material with a, with a very high aspect ratio. So it's, it's, it's thin and very long. Uh, that, that has got an ability to remove aerosols that are suspended as it flows through the, the porous uh, structure. So uh, aer aerosol filters uh, utilize uh, uh, three major mechanisms by which uh, they are able to, uh, uh, can I say, trap or, uh, uh, or remove uh, these um, uh, airborne pathogens from the air. They utilize um, uh, mechanisms of uh, inertial impaction uh, diffusion and uh, interception. 
So all these capture mechanisms of uh, aerosol particles by fibrous filters, they work together simultaneously. So I'm going now to uh, describe the, 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 the mechanisms by which filters capture these uh, pathogens. So the first one is uh, inertia. So inertia, uh, it, 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 is, it, it is predominant in uh, large particle uh, sizes um, uh, because these large particle sizes, when they are in the airstream, they have got a tendency of, uh, of, uh, of, of, of following uh, in an airstream, follow, following the direction of an airstream. So now what you see, the yellow part there, the yellow part that you see there, it is, um, it is a, a, a cross-sectional area of a fiber of a filter. So as the air, as the air, as the air hits the, 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 the fiber, uh, it changes direction. But large particles, due to their uh, mass and them being uh, large, they have got a, a tendency or they are reluctant to change uh, direction. They want to continue in their state of motion and hence uh, uh, they get to hit the fiber particle and that's how uh, they are captured through the uh, initial impaction. Then interception. So for interception, okay, condition, uh, that condition has to be uh, satisfied that I put there is when the distance from the center of mass of the particle to the fiber surface is equal or less than the radius of the particle, then we have got um, interception. Then lastly, we have got uh, diffusion. So diffusion is mainly for very um, tiny particles, the very small particles. The very small particles, they have a tendency that they don't follow the uh, the, the the streamlines uh, uh, as air flows they don't follow the 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 the, the air flow stream lines uh, they just move randomly and uh, due to the fact that um, uh, the motion randomly they end up just hitting uh, the fibers and then they get uh, trapped that way and also the other uh, mechanism diffusion is because the at the fibers the, the concentration of this pathogenic particles uh, be lower than the concentration of uh, the pathogenic particles within the airstream and it is the concentration gradient hence the small particles are mainly attracted towards the fibers uh, a very uh, important term when we talk about filters is uh, 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 filter efficiency. So filter efficiency uh, uh, by, by, by definition is one minus K, K which is the penetration. So penetration simply is the ratio between the concentration of your, uh, the concentration of your, uh, uh, okay, in this case, the pathogenic particles uh, after, after the filter divided by the concentration before the filter. It can be a mass uh, concentration or it can be a number concentration. And then so the efficiency is simply one minus the, um, uh, the, the penetration. Right, so uh, this type of filter uh, 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 can be utilized uh, in uh, portable air cleaners for the uh, capture sharing of, uh, uh, of, 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 of pathogenic um, uh, uh, particles. It's called a high efficiency particulate air filter. And according to that standard EN 1822, it has got uh, an overall filter efficiency of 99.95%, uh, right? So um, uh, of uh, importance, I, uh, I, I, I put in a uh, that uh, graphical representation of uh, that graphical representation is uh, it's, uh, uh, it's a filter overall filter efficiency curve for a HEPA filter. So there is um, so.
so oh, you, the, 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 there are so many lines that you can um, uh, uh, see there. On the x-axis, we have got uh, uh, its particle uh, uh, diameter. On the y-axis, and then we have uh, uh, the, 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 the collection efficiency as a percentage. And the graph at the right top there, it's unfortunate that we can't see each other. Uh, at the top there, that's the, 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 the total uh, efficiency uh, 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 curve right so as you can see from that graph that total efficiency curve you can see that as the particle sizes as the particle sizes become a very small that filter this HEPA filter becomes very very efficient at trapping the 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 the, the particles so in this case when we talk about these pathogenic particles uh, we are talking about very tiny particles uh, um, uh, we are talking about very tiny particles, viruses having, having uh, sizes between uh, 0.01 microns to uh, 0.01 microns to to around 0.15 uh, thereabout microns, similar also to bacteria. So this filter, the HEPA filter, is the ability to really take out these pathogenic uh, 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 particulates from the air. Right, and then lastly, the, 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 uh, the, another mechanism that we use for uh, uh, reducing uh, pathogenic particles is the use of ultraviolet germicidal uh, irradiation. So ultraviolet germicidal irradiation uh, simply it is, it is the use of uh, light, light uh, uh, in the UVC region of the electromagnetic spectrum, uh, particularly at 254 nanometers uh, wavelength. That's the one that has got a peak per, uh, germicidal effect uh, to kill uh, um, uh, these pathogenic um, uh, particulates. So as you can see an illustration that I put there, if we uh, put radiation, uh, if we put radiation, um, if we put radiation on, uh, uh, if we shine radiation uh, through air, which will be containing the pathogenic particles, be they viruses, be they uh, bacteria, uh, their DNAs are damaged to an extent that they cannot, uh, 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 they cannot, uh, 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 they cannot, they cannot uh, reform again. They are damaged, and that's how UVGI um, uh, reduces the, the 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 concentration of these pathogenic particles uh, within the air. Right. Uh, moving right on. Uh, uh, performance specifications uh, for these uh, uh, portable air cleaners. Uh, there are some uh, uh, metrics or performance specifications that are quoted by the manufacturers of portable air cleaners that are not helpful uh, 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 in terms of helping you to make a decision to acquire or to procure a particular uh, portable air cleaner. So these uh, uh, things like efficiencies, uh, they mean uh, uh, nothing. It's things like uh, the square meterage uh, coverage from these uh, portable air cleaners and also things like airflow rate, they mean nothing when, when, when you want to consider buying a portable air cleaner. The most or the, 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 the acceptable performance uh, specification for a portable air cleaner is what we call uh, a clean air delivery rate, right? So uh, a clean air delivery rate, uh, uh, it's, I can put it in quotes that it just refers to a supplementary, uh, it's, a, it's a supplementary uh, fresh air as if it was coming from a ventilation uh, system. I'm sure from the previous webinar you are, able to uh, know uh, uh, those terminologies, uh, uh, ventilation rates and, and so 
is a supplementary uh, uh, clean air flow rate is if it is coming from a ventilation system, right? Uh, so this clean air delivery rate, uh, there is, uh, it is determined from uh, some laboratory testing. So each portable air cleaner should go through a, a, a laboratory testing in order that uh, its clean air delivery rate to be determined, right? So in South Africa here, yeah, there is uh, a laboratory that does that. It's at NIOH. It is able to, uh, 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 to do that, right? So um, how do we now determine uh, to size an effective system for these uh, portable air cleaners uh, for your setting, right? So that formula, that formula that you see in, uh, in depicts the number of the uh, portable air cleaners uh, that, that you need for a particular setting. And the small n there, uh, uh, the small n there is, uh, it depicts the, the required uh, air change rate they require the air change rate that you want to achieve. So this air change rate, say in South Africa, yeah, you can get them SANS 10400 uh, parts or ventilation and lighting standard. You can get uh, uh, the, 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 the requirements for different, um, uh, for different spaces, office buildings and, and all that. Uh, then V, obviously, it will be the volume of uh, the room and then uh, the clean air delivery rate. So in that formula, that clean air delivery rate uh, will be in liters per second, if you want to utilize that. Now, uh, moving right along to monitoring and uh, maintenance for these uh, systems. So uh, real-time monitoring uh, is often not feasible or it's not uh, possible for these um, the PAC systems. And also real world measurements will not correspond to lab performance certification values for your clean air delivery rate. Since this clean air delivery rate uh, measurement is done under laboratory conditions. Uh, then uh, the airflow, measure me airflow measurements require some expensive equipment to counter turbulence problems. So uh, what that means is uh, you can get some portable uh, air cleaners uh, that uh, uh, you would require equipment uh, such as uh, 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 air capture hoods, air capture hood uh, anemometers uh, for you to, to measure airflows. So uh, the maintenance of these uh, PAC systems is mostly limited to cleaning, cleaning of internal and external uh, surfaces. Uh, filtration and electrical elements need cleaning and replacement. Accessibility to internal components is uh, critical. So this means you have to uh, purchase a portable air cleaner that you are able to dismantle and carry out uh, maintenance. So usually devices without cleaning or maintenance instructions, they may just be designed to last just one maintenance cycle uh, only, and then you throw it away. Uh, ensure that uh, the replacement parts will be obtainable when the equipment supplier is no longer in business. So these uh, parts include uh, UVGI lamps, filters, etc those things that make up the mechanism for your air cleaning technology. Uh, so also you must uh, initiate uh, the systems into uh, facilities, routine maintenance programs and uh, you must provide a budget for that as well. So thank you very much.
Okay, um, thank you, Mr. Kumarai, for the very comprehensive talk on engineering controls. Um, it's always so refreshing to learn um, about the different technical options that are available for the control um, and the management of COVID-19. Um, so Mr. Kumarai will be leaving us um, because he has to rush off to another meeting. Uh, so, but if you do have any questions, you can just write them down um, under the, the slot for question and answer sessions section, and we will um, transfer the, co um, the communication or the questions directly to him, and we'll communicate that back to you. And if you also have any other questions uh, for Ms. Marilyn Hrobler as well, you can just remember to jot them down. So um, our next speaker um, right now, we're moving on to Mr. Mark John Williams. And he is working for the South African uh, Medical Research Council um, as the National Facilities Manager for the last six years. Uh, he was previously a technical manager for Broad Properties and WSP Facility Management. And he was also a maintenance supervisor at Stellenbosch University uh, Property Services. And he's also a member of the South African Facilities Management Association. So with his qualification, um, he has a qualification in uh, facility management, uh, green building professional existing buildings, uh, health and safety and environmental management system, uh, project management, refrigeration, air conditioning, uh, and ventilation. So the title of his presentation is Realities and Challenges of Facilities Management and Safeguarding Employees When Returning to Work. So Mr. William, over to you, sir. Yeah, good morning, all. Uh, good morning also. Um, my topic is on realities and challenges of facilities management and safeguarding employees um, when returning to work. So first I will start discussing um, what we've implemented at the, MRC, at the MRC for returning of our staff to work. So we developed a return to work plan and this plan was based on the COVID-19 alert levels four and three, lockdown directors from government. So the objective of the, of the plan is to minimize the spread of the COVID-19 disease and the target is 0% transfer of the COVID-19 disease between people at the MRC. Um, the hazard was identified and associated risks to humans as per government di directives and information that we received. Uh, we appointed personnel to manage and, and control the plan. Uh, first of all, develop and then manage and control the plan. Uh, risk control measures were identified and uh, was implemented. So this plan is continuously evaluated, improved and corrected. And the plan is reviewed as business changes or change in regulations. So, um, the control, we use the hierarchy of controls um, according to the Health and Safety and Environment Occupation Health and Safety Act. So we looked at the engineering controls and um, at the MRC, we have no centralized air conditioning units. We have a few ventilation systems that we improved on. And uh, what we improved on um, was to increase uh, the volume flow so that we have more air changes um, in the office environments where they are installed. Also what we've done is that in shared office spaces, we have uh, switched all those air conditioning because it's um, shared spaces. What we've asked our IT department as well is to um, develop a computerized application to aid in health, health system screening and contract tracing. So what this app actually could do is, you could log on to our internet and from home, you could then um, do symptom screening, except taking your temperature, but if you felt that um, you were positive to some of the sym symptoms, uh, we would recommend that you stay at home and inform your line manager. 
So that means before you leave your house, you can screen yourself. So it was a very it easily um, a very uh, useful app. And the same app we use um, at the screening stations um, nationally before uh, people enter into the into the workplace. Uh, what we also on engineering controls, what we've also done is uh, installation of screens in close proximity and frequent contact areas, especially our uh, reception areas, um, where we are contact, always in contact with visitors and deliveries. So under administration controls, we've um, implemented a, um, a long list. So very importantly, we appointed a COVID-19 compliance officer for the MRC nationally. And uh, because we are a national organization, what we've done is we've um, requested that our research units you know, appoint a compliance marshal, just to make sure that we are compliant with the directives from um, government. Um, we also developed a COVID-19 positive case SOP, and it's been implemented in the case of uh, a positive uh, case at the organization. So what we've also done, we've done a work plan schedule for all employees so that we can schedule the work so that we don't have a huge number of employees at the same time at work. And touching back on the screening, we screen each employees and visitors before they can enter the building or enter the site. And we've also installed that you will not be able to enter our premises without a face mark or uh, sanita sanitizing your hands. So continue with the administration controls under the sanitation. So we've uh, requested that, you know, um, that our cleaning staff, that we've changed our ways of cleaning so that we have more frequent cleaning and new methods, you know, and chemical solutions that we are using, uh, which is used in the frequently used facilities like the kitchens, your restrooms and the toilets. We've implemented sanitizer stations throughout the building. It's not just at the entrance, but as you go through the building, each passage where as you enter, you'll find a hands-free sanitation station that we want people to, to use when they're entering that area or when they're leaving that area to go to another area. We also request that our staff, you know, frequently, at least every hour, wash, wash their hands. Um, like I said, our cleaning frequency has been, has been adjusted. But what we've also asked is that our staff you know, clean their own workstation, wipe it down regularly because we, could, we can't have our cleaners um, coming to your workstation or their workstation every hour to wipe it down. It's just not practical. On the social distancing side, uh, where, where possible, we will reorganize shared office space and open plan workspaces where needed to improve social distancing. And we've also implemented the social distance markers. So uh, continuing on social distancing, uh, it's being requested that employees remain at their workstations for as far as possible and not move around unnecessarily. And also that we, especially in our common areas like our kitchens and toilets, that no more than two employees use the common areas at the time. Uh, which applies to our lifts as well. Our lifts is quite small. So what we've put up is to say only one person to use the lift at the, um, at the time. Uh, we've also implemented shift, um, uh, shift work to reduce the number of employees um, in the building at one time. Our canteen remains closed, uh, probably until the epidemic is, uh, is, is finished. And uh, we've instructed our employees to bring their own mug and spoon um, for refreshment so to avoid sharing. So um, the big plus for us is that uh, we've requested all the EMC's request, I say to management councillors requested that employees work from home and not come to work unless necessary. This is a big plus for um, facilities. On the personal protective side, it's just a list of what we uh, distribute to our staff. 
uh, when they do come to work. And as the MRC, we, have, we do have field, we do have field workers, we have high risk employees that's in contact with um, uh, uh, with the participants and, and so forth. So the issuing of our PPE is as per risk category, which comes out of the risk assessments that we've done. So uh, yeah, going on with this, it's bonnets, caps, isolation guns, uh, depends on the PPE required um, on the type of work that you are performing. So that is the, are we safeguarding our employees against COVID-19? And then um, in short, you know, the positives and challenges, the positives that's, uh, that, that uh, we've experienced is that, you know, executive management's concerned with the health and safety and well-being of employees. And, um, you know, therefore, um, employees over the age of 60s as directed by government, but what we're looking at is also employers 55 and those with comorbidities is asked to work from home. Employers that can work from home is encouraged to do so. So what this means is that our facility occupancy average is 15% daily, which is very little and the potential transfer of virus is then reduced substantially. Uh, the burden on facilities and health and safety staff required is reduced. We've got less public uh, tolerant blind employees, a reduction in utility and maintenance costs from the facilities uh, uh, point of view. Then the challenges that uh, we face in, um, the, in our arena was um, the location of the health screening stations. Seeing that we national and what we do have is that in, in our in the regions in Pretoria and Durban, we've got, um, in each of the regions, we all look at one building, so that's easy to have an access point. You know, so your, your, your main entry will be your, your, your access point. So there wasn't too much challenges there, but the challenge at the Medicina campus, because it's a campus with various buildings, um, we had a challenge where to actually put the screening stations, which meant that we had to close down some roads and lead um, traffic and um, employees and visitors to one central point. Uh, but that we've um, sorted out. You know, it's a lot of control that we need to put in place so that we can ensure that um, all that visits our site does get screened on a daily basis. The challenges we also face from our own staff is that the public transport um, system as we all know, um, we are limited um, uh, uh, people in a minibus, taxi, or in, in a bus. So what we find is that our staff, um, sometimes they are late. You know, we need to uh, double up on staff, staff get sick, and it all um, adds into our service delivery uh, to the organization. But the positive on that is, again, that most of our staff in facilities because of only the 15% occupation, occupation is that most of our staff um, don't need to come to work. So we've also got little staff at work, which is a big plus. And um, then procurement of the PPE, you know, we have major challenges with uh, um, national territory uh, directives, you know, we have time and versus the cost, as well as uh, manufacturing um, industry was closed especially for our, our screens that, um, that we require. These are all challenges that we're facing and um, we're facing, um, but most of the challenges has, um, has passed. And then also the other big challenge we do have is, you know, it's the change management, change of employee mindset um, to the COVID-19 um, virus. You know, we request that they, when they are in the offices, the up, switch of air conditioners, open windows and doors for proper ventilation we required. Uh, we do find that um, they don't do it and then it is on facilities to go and really open the windows. Um, social distancing is not, is not practiced as it should, but I think, you know, it's only human uh, when you are in contact with your child employee, you have a discussion and 
um, about work or, or whatever, just social discussion, and you forget that you need to stand 1.5, at least 1.5 meters um, apart. So um, we, we, we encourage that um, they maintain their social distancing uh, wherever possible. We also find that you know, the wearing of the face mask um, at all times in the office environment, it's, it's, it's quite difficult. Um, because to keep the face mask, we use cloth masks and surgical masks, but you do find that they slip it down to the chin and then they need to be reminded uh, you need to wear your face mask. And also the frequent wipe down of uh, the workstations. Um, so the scenario is that you're so busy with your work that you actually forget that, look, we need to wipe down you know, as frequently um, as possible. And the same goes for washing of, of, of hands. So the big challenge is actually the employee mindset, you know, which hasn't changed. But the plus on that is that, you know, the 15% occupancy rate. So um, we don't have uh, um, a lot of staff at the MOC nationally. At the same time, most of our staff works remotely. Thank you, that's all from me. Okay, thank you, Mark. Um, I, I understand having to deal with like the new normal, which is COVID-19 can be quite challenging um, as an organization. And it's quite impressive to see such great work that the MRC is doing to, to safeguard their employees. Um, so with that said, now we, we, we're gonna move on to the last segment of our webinar, uh, where we're gonna tackle the questions. So we have, so far we have 30 questions, I guess um, a few questions. So what I'm gonna do is I'll just direct firstly the first question to um, Ms. Hrabler. Um, we have a question for you from Neta, um, who says, thank you Ms. Hrabler for the concise and informative presentation. What is your response to the WHO message about COVID-19 being airborne in terms of additional prevention methods when out at work or at shopping um, centers, et cetera. Marilyn, um, you might be muted. Unmute you yourself. Um, I cut a copy. It might be that Marulin has left. She um, let us. She sent a message to say that they are experiencing load shedding. Okay, okay, I guess we can move on to um, the next question. Um, to any of the panelists who can answer this, what is the, um, the question is from Rian, and he's asking, what is the life of the TIO uh, coating on example, a door handle? Uh. Okay, uh, the, uh, I, I can't answer that one uh, right now, but I can uh, uh, look up some uh, references to get uh, that answer right. Okay. Okay, thank you for that, Titch. Um, the next question is directed to uh, Mr. Mark, they saying, uh, also from Neta. Uh, thanks for the valuable uh, session. What training was provided to the compliance officers and marshals? Please advise their feedback on compliance and implementation. Mark? Yeah, so uh, to answer that question, uh, we are in the process of, of providing uh, the training. We have appointed our um, national health and safety uh, manager as the, uh, the COVID compliance officer who would then um, give the training to the marshals. Um, at the moment, uh, we're busy with that program. Haven't implemented it. Okay. 
Uh, thank you for that, Mark. Um, and we also have a question uh, from Ms. Peter Deaga. I, um, this is going to be directed to Techoana. Um, can you use ultraviolet mm -hmm. light to disinfect surfaces? Uh, yes. The answer is yes, you can. Okay. And okay, and then the next question, um, I think, um, Marty, I'll just partly ask you if you have any comments um, for the panelists before I ask some more questions. Actually, uh, sorry, sorry, Katikani, just to expand on uh, UVGI surface disinfection, uh, we have written uh, something comprehensive. Uh, sort of like a guideline for UVGI surface uh, disinfection and uh, we wrote it actually specifically for this uh, SARS-CoV-2. Uh, I think I will share the uh, link to the side uh, wiki that contains much more information on uh, UVGI uh, surface disinfection. Thank you. Thank you for that, Titch. Um, Marty? Yes, thank you, uh, Katakani, for the opportunity and um, the questions that Titch answered. Um, I think it's a very good um, introduction on what I want to say. Um, in terms of UVGI, UVGI as an air disinfection measure um, is a very, very important tool that we have, but it needs to be used appropriately. We found in the research that was conducted um, together with the University of Pretoria, CSIR and the MRC, that um, UVGI is very effective, um, but it needs to be combined with a mixing. At the start of the series of webinars, we paid contribution, contribution to the light um, Professor Anton Stolz that passed away in, on 20 May 2020 and the contribution that his research made towards the understanding of airborne infection control. Of course that research focused on tuberculosis but a lot from what we understand now um, in terms of the airborne infection control of COVID we know from tuberculosis research. So one of the experiments that was done um, on UVGI uh, specifically determined what's the optimal dosing schedules for the UVGI um, devices. And as Stitch also referred in his presentation, that the efficacy of um, any airborne or air disinfection device need to be determined and these devices need to operate at that specific level. So the research that was uh, done that we, Professor Stolz participated, also determined what are the optimal dosing schedules for UVGI devices. And that's also um, contained in the documents from the CSIR. UVGI, of course, is a very potent uh, microbicidal, uh, micro as um, Teach also showed that it damages the DNA. Um, of the pathogens in the air, but the wrong use of these devices provides uh, a false sense of security. So it's really important that people that consider using UVGI as air disinfection are certain that the um, light source um, are, um, meet certain industry standards. Thank you, Katakani. Okay, thank you for that very comprehensive comment, uh, Marty. Uh, Tich, um, there's two questions here for you. Um, most building, number one, it's most buildings do not have windows to open or, yeah, and windows can open or they can open up a little bit. So how should they handle such a situation when where they don't have um, the luxury or the opportunity to open their windows for natural ventilation. And the second question is how long does exposure, how, how much exposure is needed um, for UVC, UVC light um, to disinfect? Titch, over to you. Uh, so the first question, they are saying that the windows don't open, am I right? 
Yes, uh, the windows might open slightly or in, in some buildings there are no windows at all or some rooms there are no windows at all. Okay, so uh, what, what kind of setting is that? Is that an office setting? Is that a healthcare setting? Or what, what is it? Um, they did not mention, but maybe you can give it us, give us um, from those two perspectives. In a healthcare setting, what do you do and how do you manage it? And in an office setting, how do you manage it as well? Okay, I can say that, okay, there are, there are guidelines or standards for ventilation rates for particular spaces, be it office um, uh, environments, be it uh, healthcare settings, healthcare settings for different spaces within healthcare settings. So uh, uh, the first point of call before uh, deciding on uh, any other intervention to, uh, to, 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 to implement is to, first of all, probably assess uh, how much uh, of ventilation are they getting from those windows that are opening slightly. That's the first point of uh, departure. And then if that ventilation rate does not uh, equate to or does not meet the required uh, levels, then um, uh, mitigation uh, measures can uh, be implemented. For example, I, I don't know the setting, maybe uh, UVGI, as uh, Marty was explaining, as an upper room, um, upper room UVGI uh, implementation, uh, or these portable uh, air cleaners, though maybe you might need quite a lot. I don't know the setting and, 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 and uh, that they are asking uh, in regard, right? Right, uh, then coming to the next question, how much uh, exposure? Okay, how much exposure? That question is, uh, it is uh, pathogenic uh, dependent. Uh, so um, uh, they are what they term the UV red constants to calculate the amount of uh, uh, dosage that can that sh that a, a pathogen must be um, must be um, uh, uh, irradiated with for it to 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 have that germicidal effect. So they. There are experiments that are done that determines the the K values, so we may say, and and those K values you can uh, substitute that uh, um, uh, those uh, K values in, in in what we call uh, 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 a single stage uh, decay equation uh, for pathogens that are uh, exposed to UV. So yes, that's how I can answer that question. Okay, thank you for that, uh, Tich. Um, I don't know, Marty, do you have a, a quick comment? Yes, thank you, um, Katakani. I want to also comment on the issue of windows that can only open minimally in, and to have a ventilation in a room. Well, in South Africa, it's very warm climates. Um, we all prefer to have air conditioning, and I think that sensitized all of us, or desensitized everyone um, for opening windows, or that we are aware that a window cannot really open. And we also closes, we close doors because it, um, with air conditioning, one should um, keep a certain area um, closed. Uh, so I think it's a very difficult mindset that everyone will have to go through to say if you enter a room or face-to-face um, -face meetings, which we will again have, first of all, open all the windows, even a little bit, and then see if there are other doors that can also be opened um, and be aware of air ventilation. And I think the wearing of masks um, should be and ought to be with us going forward. Every one of us, if any one of us um, sneezes or have a cough,
cough, even if it's uh, a normal irritation cough um, because of um, air pollutants, one should have a, a, a wear a mask with you um, and have it at all times with you. And we will uh, think going forward, everyone will not think it unnaturally if someone enters, uh, participates in a face to face meeting and you wear a, a mask. Okay. Okay, thank you. Thank you for that, Marty. Um, Mark, there's a quick question for you as well. Um, they're asking, will you be considering putting up posters to remind staff of what is, of what is required? Uh, well, to answer that, I mean, if you look at my slides there, we do have posters um, throughout the buildings um, nationally. Um, so posters are, are displayed on our walls. Okay. Okay, so um, I guess one last question uh, from me will be to teach uh, just to get your opinion. Um, what do you think are the safety or risk factors or the levels of safety um, with regards to airplanes? Because obviously they've banned the travel um, in airplanes, but there's movement that is taking place. So from an engineering perspective, um, what level of risk with regards to COVID-19 uh, can you place on, um, on planes? Yeah, uh, Kate, that is a very difficult question. Uh, but, uh, well, I, 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 there is, I think Toby, 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 are you, are you available? Are you, are you, are you there? Uh, if you can just um, answer that question, because I know you are belonging to a, uh, is it a task team for aeroplanes or uh, or something? Maybe you can give a, a much more informed answer with regards to that question. I'm sorry, Kate. I, I, my question would not be really, um, no. Of course. Uh, Yes, to the point. Maybe, maybe Toby can, can Toby can you can you type in there? <laughs> yeah, I'm not uh, sure if. Uh, uh, yeah. uh, can I answer that question for you? Yes, please, Mark. Um, there are there are always air changes inside um, inside a, um, a airplane, and they do have HEPA filters, something similar to HEPA filters, inside your plane. Mm -hmm. Okay. So I guess there is some level of protection. Um, so ladies and gentlemen, I guess this draws us to the end of our Q&A session. Um, so thank you very much for a very informative, interactive session. Thank you to our very um, experienced, well-informed uh, panelists, and thank you very much for your comprehensive presentations. So now I'll hand over to Marty to just close the session. And tell us on the way forward. Thank you, Katakani, and um, thank you for hosting um, the question and answer session um, very well, and also to, for introducing the speakers. So, um, all that's left for me to say thank you to everyone uh, for your active participation and um, the speakers also. Thank you um, for the many people that joined us over the world. Um, very good to, to hear your comments and um, um, also see your um, questions. So um, I want to also to thank um, Ms. Peter de Jager from the CSIR, from the Smart Places, um, build, um, Smart Places Division at the CSIR. Um, Peter, um, do you want to say a last comment um, from your side? Just to thank everybody for your participation and to um, thank you, the MRC, for uh, taking the initiative to host this. I think it's very important. Um, and I think that uh, we will be, have, this has been recorded and we will be sharing the links and I think that we need to be more active in making sure that these conversations continue and that good information is, is shared um, because uh, there is a lot of, a lot of um, uncertainty and hype 
uh, and uh, confusion. So to everybody, be safe, be sensible, and uh, thank you very much for your support. The last words from me is to say goodbye to everyone um, and keep safe social distancing, wear the masks and sanitize surfaces. Goodbye. Thank <laughs> you.